Thanks, Joyce. Um, well, thank you so much for coming out. Um, I am the physical education and athletics coordinator for Surrey School District. I've uh, been in that position uh, 16 years or 17 years now. I've lost track and teaching for, I think, 31, 32. I can't remember. I've lost track as well. Um, I love my job. It's not a job. Uh, I, I look forward to it every day. Um, the summer's long enough. I'm, I'm itching to go back already. So uh, I get to drive. I, I say the best thing for my job is I get to drive the bus in terms of physical education for my school district. So I'm really happy about that. Our uh, intentions today are to look at giving you a little more knowledge around fundamental movement skills uh, and then try to look at Okay, so I have this knowledge, what do I do with it? So how to implement some real quick and simple strategies around implementation. Um, a lot of my workshops are designed for my teachers. I present it today, you can deliver it tomorrow. Okay, so, so that's the idea around that. Um, so I'm gonna give you some ideas with regards to uh, dynamic warmups. Look at uh, movement analysis framework. It sounds real technical, but you'll see it's pretty simple. And then the key thing is the assessment for learning. Okay, how do we know where the kids are? How do we help them improve to get better? Okay, so that's that's our intentions. Your 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 choice. What what we're going to be doing here is pretty low key, in terms of intensity level, pretty light. Okay, when we do the the ABC Fit, it'll be a little higher. But here, you want notes? It's totally up to you. If you want to sit back and observe, go ahead. If you want to participate, it's up to you, okay? So, um, beautiful summer, in the middle of summer, why are you here? Really, why are you here? You're dedicated, obviously, but what do you want to get out of today's session? Any idea, anybody want to, just one or two people, what are you looking for? What's the takeaway? Okay, we will address that. Uh, I have a, I guess, a specialization in secondary when I go back to rainbow, I'm going into an elementary setting. I spoke to you earlier that the buzzword in our school is literacy, so I guess I'm trying to tie those two together. Okay, yep. Yeah, our district is taking on a, a student success um, literacy focus as well, and I wanted to show the importance of physical literacy to provide to the teachers. Yeah, I want to capitalize on that as well. Okay, um, so what we're going to look at um, really is around trying to take the concept of physical literacy because uh, it we've heard this morning that there is like there's this new thing supposedly, but it's been around for a while. But really, Dr. Whitehead's intention behind physical literacy is really a philosophical look at it. And so we're trying to take a philosophical piece and try to deconstruct it into a more um, concrete thing, which is much harder to do. Sorry, I think I stole your... Okay. So what are going to be the learning intentions of this session? We've actually, we're actually going to be doing this presentation in three parts. In the first part, Glenn is going to present to you a series of learning experiences. I don't want to use just the term physical activities. I'm going to use the term learning experiences that are going to focus on um, trying to put the words together and stringing them together to make sentences. And then I'll be taking the movement analysis framework and then we're going to look back onto the meaning of the sentences which we then created and deconstruct it and find out what are the specific letters and words that make those sentences up. How can we change the order of the words to create the how can we modify the task and the words to develop different kinds of tasks to match the different ability levels of the children we are working with? You all are aware that the kids are going to have different backgrounds. You're going to have the kids who knows how to throw and catch the ball, and the next thing you might, you might have a peer who has not much experience in playing with balls. So, how can you differentiate your task to meet the different ability that the brain has? And also, how can we get the kids to practice and practice and practice at the level which they're at before they move to the next one? 
in a way which is challenging to them, motivating to them, because you know it takes about 10,000 hours of practice time to develop skill mastery. So how can we do that when we have such a differentiated range of abilities in the class? And then the last part is how are we going to assess? If we cannot understand where our kids are at, how can we move them towards the next step? If the kids can't read, how can we expect them? to read sentences, paragraphs, and books if they still talk, if they are still, for example, struggling with letter recognition. So this is what we're going to be covering today, and then we'll be going to this section. Great, thanks, Marina. So if you could sort of direct your attention down into the corner here. Um, we heard this morning fundamental movement skills, and there are actually subsets, like different organizations have different subsets of what fundamental movement skills are. They're really, I haven't come across a universal subset of fundamental movement skills. There are some constants like run, jump, throw, are very constants throughout different countries. But for the most part, this is generally what I've been able to find. So if you look at the orange ones here, uh, and if you need to, to move, please, please feel free so that you can see that. Uh, they are just in alphabetical order. They're not in any other sequence other than alphabetical order. So the question that I have for you is, and it can be rhetorical or you can actually uh, show, how many of these can you actually perform proficiently? Because we heard that term, proficiently. Okay, So that can be rhetorical or you can go, yeah, I can. And then who taught you? And how did you learn these? Okay, So, and do you know what all of them are? Maybe you might not know what all of them are. Um, for example, uh, what's the significance of teaching these? We heard this morning, if you can't run, you can't engage in. If you can't throw, you can't engage, etc. But let's look at some of these other ones that are really, really critical. So crawling is a great one. Do we see little kids crawling anymore? little babies when learning. They don't, we, parents generally, I don't have kids so I can't comment on that, but from what I've seen from friends, generally kids, babies aren't allowed to crawl anymore because they could get hurt, they're dirty, germs, etc. Right? So they lose this fundamental movement skill of crawling. And why is crawling so critical? Because it's developing this contralateral movement pattern. So if the brain isn't learning that through crawling, and they don't get to climb, because climbing is going to involve the same thing if you have those, um, the ladders, or the gymnastics stuff, the wall apparatus in your gym, same idea. So these two are really intimately linked, and one's a sequence out of the other. Um, <laughs> dodge, and I'm not thinking dodge ball, okay? But although dodge ball, dodge is a skill, but dodge is really agility. So have you ever, <laughs> When you ask your kids to do something as simple as a zigzag, they can't. They can't plant, cut, and shift. It's a kind of a, a little serpentine pattern. Right? So the ability to teach dodge is a complex skill. Okay? The ability to accelerate, decelerate, pivot, turn, etc. That's all included in that. Um, gallop. I've always wondered, what's gallop? Can you do gallop? Can you just quickly do gallop? Okay, good, stop. So, in my younger years as a secondary phys ed teacher, thinking, what the heck do I need to know about, about Gallup? Why do I need to teach that to the kids? Why? Because this fundamental shifting of the weight then leads to, and you basketball coaches, and you football coaches who need to get kids to move in that defensive slide position, this is a Gallup, but it's sideways. It's that shift, it's the same leg leading forward. So this is gallop. So if they can't do this, they, good English, they ain't gonna get this, okay? So gallop's really important. And you can see the sequence of all the other activities. So a roll here is the, could be the log roll, could be a shoulder roll, could be a forward roll. All you're trying to do is get, give the brain the kinesthetic sense of rotation. So that's the role. Did you learn any of those? 
Were you, were you taught, right? Most of these, active play, free play, is how kids generally acquire. But they don't do that like this, right? So that's locomotor. The yellow ones, next category, non-locomotor or body stabilization or body awareness. How many of those are you proficient at? Who taught you? Or have you learned all of them? We use non-locomotor on a daily basis. Okay, look at all of these. Bend, lift, stand, lower, curl. Okay, all of these are used on a daily basis. When do we get taught? When you get hurt. You go to your physio. That's who teaches you how to do these properly. Okay? So this is about functional daily performance. Okay? That's what this is all about. And again, many of these, how many times do you see um, brochures by workman's compensation or how to lift an object, okay, bend, etc., all of that kind of stuff? This is about safety. And we take this for granted on a daily basis. We assume everybody can do this, but there is a correct way to do it. It's just like 2 plus 2 equals 5. No, it doesn't. We don't want you doing this incorrectly. Just a simple task of standing. You go back and you look at, your, look at yourself now, all the different variations of standing. There's a correct way to stand where your core and your lower back, your lower back especially, is disengaged. And when you find that, that position, all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, there's no back pain. All you have to do, I'm, I'm, I'm bird walking a bit here, just put your hands on your lower back and you'll feel the lower back. If you're shifting, the, if, you're, if your weight, your posture, your head is forward and your weight is on your toes, your lower back is constantly engaged. Those muscles are totally firing. Shift the weight back, have your head go right over where it's supposed to be, right over your body and your spine supporting your head and all of a sudden, you can feel the muscles in the low back shut off. That's how we're supposed to stand. So where do you learn that? That's, I learned that from my physio. All of these, okay, very, very important. We need to teach that. Last category is the purple ones. You can get the big gold star. This is not in alpha order. These two were. This is not in alpha order. If you can sort of see the pattern, you are, you are awesome. You understand it. And it's, it's, it's tough to get. Carry an object, football, whatever, okay? Carry a stick, no, carry an object, okay? So a ball type of thing, dribbling, hands or feet. These are retaining. So this, this category is called manipulatives. So we're man manipulating um, an object or we're, we're manipulating with an implement, like a stick a racket, etc. So we're retaining, we're sending, and we're receiving. Okay? So that's manipulatives. These, the beauty of these two, especially this one, easy to remediate almost at any age. Obviously the younger, the window's greater. As we progress to here, much harder to remediate. Okay, if you haven't been taught how to catch or throw as a kid, for me to try to teach, it's going to be much harder than it is. It's the same as language acquisition. Okay, that's why everything gets forced to those primary teachers. Everybody wants to, because that's the window. All right? So that's the three categories we're looking at. Okay. So if we're talking about, I, I think uh, John this morning was talking about the definition of physical literacy and we're adding the proficiency in there. So I started doing some research around that. What, is it, what, is it, what does proficiency mean? What does expert mean, etc.? And I came across the work of um, Canadian professor Ye, Dr. Uh, Levitin at uh, McGill. And it's interesting how it's coming from psychology and neuroscience, same field of study that Dr. Rady is in. And it's around mastery. So I'm not sure if you've heard of the rule 10,000 or the 10-year rule or 10,000 hours. And so 
what Dr. Levitin did in his book, uh, This Is Your Brain on Music, The Science of a Human Obsession, he looked at what are the characteristics around proficiency. If you have an hour, you know some basics. If you, go, if you get 10 hours, then you're getting a, a very good idea. And at 100 hours, he's saying you're fairly expert. At 1,000 hours, you're an experienced expert, and at 10,000 hours, you are definitely a master and very proficient. What are, what, what are we trying to do with our classes? Pick whatever unit, sport, volleyball, basketball, whatever you pick. Do the kids even get an hour of a particular skill within, so I'm going to pick volleyball because that was one of my sports. So, We've always tried to teach forum pass, tried to teach volley, try to teach a spike, try to teach um, a serve. Traditionally, we introduce that one skill, maybe practice a little bit the next one, then move on and move on because I've got to cover all those things so we can get to the game. How many repetitions do they get to practice? We, basically, we don't even leave them at the know your basics because they don't get an hour of pure practice time. Right? How many of you have kids that have taken dance lessons or music lessons? Right? They go to their teachers once a week, expectation to practice, come back and build on that. We don't have that with our kids because we don't give PE homework per se. Go home and practice dodging. Go home and practice throwing. Okay? We don't do that. So how do we expect our kids to get to that proficient level or even a basic level if that isn't there? Oh, and by the way, how many of you are golfers? Okay, I feel your pain, right? If you've never golfed before, or never, you're smart, stay away from it. But if you do golf and you practice, try to practice, if there isn't a coach watching you, what you think you're doing versus what you are doing are so far apart. So when you practice and there's no feedback, it's like me going to Ray Charles and saying, can you watch my swing and give me some tips? Not going to happen, right? So you need to have that constant feedback for improvement. And again, with 30 kids, we can't do that. Or so that's very challenging. Okay. So that's that piece. So here's an activity that I'd want you to start off with. So what I'm going to do is look at these activities. We're going to primarily take these two and add them into what are dynamic warm-ups. And the other thing that I wanted to show you here on, on this side, the sort of pinkish, purplish uh, posters are the components of uh, fitness on the health-related side. And I purposely don't have um, body composition on there, but it's divided into endurance, flexibility, and strength. And then the green ones are actually what are called the sport or skill-related components. And I like to refer to them as brain-related components. And you'll see why when we start, uh, as we start to do this warm-up activity, um, how your brain has to be engaged. And so my key thing around what we're going to do today is really activating your brain and getting your brain going more so than your body. Because how many times do your kids walk into the gym and it's like, oh, we get gym so we don't have to think. And they're brain dead. They're literally brain dead. And so we have to set the expectation that once you're in the school, your brain's on. It doesn't matter if you're in the classroom, you're in the art room, you're in the drama room, you're in the gym or in the shop. Your brain is on. This is a learning, and this is my classroom. This is my learning environment, okay? And that's the message the kids and your colleagues need to understand, and your principals as well, okay? So that, those, those are key pieces as well with the fundamental movement pieces. So for me, they are, um, they are in, engaged together. It's a symbiotic relationship. So what we're going to do today, oh, and then the last thing is uh, in terms of intensity, and that's these yellow posters. Um, I have a new clerk and she didn't uh, do these properly. These are supposed to be color coded. 
This is supposed to be um, yellow. These two are supposed to be green. It's supposed to be along the traffic light. Uh, this is supposed to be yellow again, and then that's supposed to be red. Okay. So the idea is when we hear terminology out that's put up by exercise physiologists, the Canadian Medical Association, all these different bodies about saying our population needs to engage in moderate to vigorous physical activity. What does it look like? What does moderate to vigorous look like? It's not really defined. Okay. So what I've done is try to create sort of a very simple scale that your kids can use and your classes can use. Okay. And, and I'll, I'll show you more information about this when we get into ABC Fit. Um, but we're going to be working for the most of us at this light and maybe to moderate range. Okay. So there's no hard stuff happening here. So <laughs> relax. Plus you just had lunch and I don't want to, I don't want that to happen. So. Even though he's called them dynamic warm-ups, I want you to look at them not just as a warm-up activity which you are doing just prior to your lesson, but this actually can also be the core part of your lesson for your lesson uh, development section itself. So when your kids come into the gym, give them something. Uh, quite a few of my, my uh, secondary schools now um, have programmed their classes. When they come into the gym, they start a dynamic warm-up. And, and there are a bunch of varying kinds. I kind of really like this figure eight format because it's very specific and it really activates the brain. I really hate the, and I used to do this a lot when I was coaching as well as teaching is, hey kids run around the gym for a couple times and then when I'm ready, I'll call you in. Okay, it was kind of a filler time. So I want, I want to maximize my time with the kids. So this one um, is called figure eight and it's just simply a figure eight um, movement pattern. So I'm, I'm going in between the cones, okay, and I'm going around this way. And I'm going to suggest that if you want it easier on your brain to start with, beginner mode is use the, use the uh, cones. And if you want it more challenging, is to try to do the figure eight without the cones. So what you're trying to do is try to carve two even circles or, or even snowmen, so to speak. Where did I learn this? From my physio. Went from um, years of sprained ankles from playing volleyball. This is a great warm up as you're doing the figure eight because you work the medial and the lateral aspects of your body. You're working your ankles, knees, and hips in terms of lower body warm up. It's gentle rather than sharp cuts, okay, etc. So you can, the beauty of this, you can, as you go into this, um, I'm going to show you what I call gears. Just like a standard car, first gear is just just nice and easy, very leisurely. Second gear be about half your speed. And then third gear would be three quarter speed. Okay? And as because we're doing this as a warm up, we won't go fourth gear. Okay? So in the secondary or characteristics or the sport skill or brain related components, I'm going to look at your reaction time as an activity with this. So enough chatting. If you want, grab cones. You're going to find your own spot on the floor. You can, you can try to not go bigger than this, but if you want a little more challenge, you can make it smaller. You can experiment. What is it like trying a small eight versus a large eight? So set up your area, and then I'm going to, when you're ready, I'm going to have you go into, I'll call it the gears. I'm going to progress you like you would with a standard car, first gear, second gear, third gear. And then we'll play a game, which is what the kids want to do. So I'll show you that, okay? So grab stuff and go. I see I'm rambling. Hey, Brian, how are you? Take a bunch, pass that around. Everybody's going for the easy version. Oh, you have more. Look yeah. at you go. Here's an extra one. Okay. Who's to say you can't just like... Who's to say you just have to run it, right? Yeah. You, 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 you're ahead of me, Brian. You're ahead of me. Okay, so stop. So, first thing that... If you're a kindergarten grade one teacher, what I just asked you to do takes you till about January, right? 
have, getting them to stop. <laughs> so what we're going to look at reaction time is really about listening skills. So a great way to assess your kids' listening skills and processing is with some of these types of activities. Okay, so I'm going to have you just, I'm going to call up the gears, first gear, second gear, whatever your gear happens to be, it happens to be. Okay, if you're injured or whatever, you just, you adapt, you modify. If you, we just had lunch, so you can slow it down even more. Okay, so here we go, first gear. So what I, be in tune with your lower body. You can feel both the medial and the lateral aspects of the body. Your ankles, knees, and hips. Second gear. Try to feel the difference now of muscles being engaged by going into second gear. And third gear. Okay, back down to second gear. That was interval training. <laughs> and back to first gear. And take it down to a walk. And stop. If you look at the exertion scale, you would be at light intensity if you could do that all day. It's like it felt like a walk in the park. Your breathing wasn't very high. Your heart rate wasn't very high. You certainly weren't feeling warmer. Okay? So that would be the definition of light. If you were in moderate, oh, I'm already feeling a little warm. If I had a top on, I'd need to take that off. Then your intensity level would have been at moderate. We all cars are different. We are all different. We can't expect everybody to be at that same level, okay? So we are only going to stay in all the activities we're doing. We're only going to stay in light and moderate. So don't worry about getting too vigorous, all right? So now I want to activate the brain, okay? And we're going to play a game, age-old game, go, go, stop, okay? When the music goes on, that's when you move. As soon as the music stops, you need to stop. What am I looking for, though, in terms of components of fitness, brain components, brain-related fitness? I'm looking at reaction time. So when, I, when the music's on, I want to see, are you going or how long does, of a delay is there before you're moving? But more importantly, as soon as that music stops, I want to see if you, the, like, the whole class to just freeze, okay? And I guarantee when we do it, there'll be the odd person that will just stop and continue. So that's getting them to activate and focus on what we're trying to do. As I increase the speed, I'm going to be looking for this, okay? And I won't, get, I won't tell you about that yet. So, ready. You just simply, locomotor pattern is just simply um, running or jog. No, I don't even say run, but just a, a slow jog, but going in first gear. In your figure eight, in your figure eight. And oh, don't you love technology? What happened? Okay, it's working there. There we go. So you do you want to stop and uh, do you want to just pause, stop and start it? Yeah. Okay. So what I'm quickly scanning for is the type of stops. I see some people in a stride stop, and I see some people with their feet together. I'll comment more about that in a second. So just think, which one's better? You just, is this right, is this wrong? I want you to think about that, here we go. Second gear. Good, no one's falling, so everybody's got pretty good balance. No one's falling flat on their face. Okay, it's good. Okay. Third gear. Oh, 
Okay, all right. So, if you notice, the faster you went, the harder it was to stop. Okay, and again, in the small confined space of the figure eight, um, a little challenge to stop. Most of you, it looks like, are, are trying to stop in the hardest position, which is a stride stop. Imagine running as fast as you can and then trying to stop like this. Okay, very, very hard to do. Basketball coaches, what's the stop you want them to do? Thank you, all right? So, that is the best stop, okay? Is a two foot jump stop, which actually gets you into that squat and athletic ready position, okay? So, here's what I want you to try. If you're not sure how that it happens, I'm gonna teach this to you like a dance move. So you're gonna stand with your feet together, but sh shoulder width apart, or hip width apart, step out with your right leg, and land on both feet, okay? So we want to absorb, so triple flexion, ankles, knees, hips, absorb, okay? So we're dropping the butt down. So what I've been finding with working with kids and teachers, the squat, and now adults, the squat, one of the hardest things to do. So many people do the squat incorrectly, okay? Ask them to do a squat, their, knee, their weight's way on their toes, their back straight up or something like this. So we want to sit back, we want to sit back. You should be able to see your, your toes, okay? Drop the hips back. So we're looking at hip flexion. And you're gonna feel it in the quads. That's where you're gonna feel it, okay? So when, when you hear the music to stop, you're moving at any speed and it's quiet. Your kids, when you first do it, will go, that's not what we want, okay? We don't want that. We want absorption through the body, but quiet. Okay, so let's try that. First gear. Okay, so here's the classic example of how we tend to teach. We show that we demonstrate the skill and then we, we let, I didn't let you really practice and I'm looking for reasonable proficiency already. Okay, so what I should have done is simply this, with no music, or just the music on, but you on your own, go through this pattern, step, 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 to practice that, okay? Add the basketball if you want. Okay, all right, so we can add a manipulative to it, but the key foundational piece is learning that two foot jumps up. So, let's step back, go ahead, practice that, with the music on, we'll just do it for about 30 seconds. It should be super quiet. Okay, good, good. How many of you actually switched the lead foot? So it, was, it wasn't always the right foot, okay? And that's part of building the bilateral proficiency within your brain, okay? If you always stepped out with that right foot and did that, this time try it left foot, left foot. And you're gonna find quite a bit of a difference. So go ahead, try that again, just really quickly. I know. Okay. So again, this is a workshop that I do with my teachers that's a half day workshop, just working on, on this piece with dynamic warmups. So Brian had a great suggestion, he was already a mile ahead of me, was, oh, you can take the locomotor patterns and now slide them into here. So let's try this. And this is a great way for me with my class to, to go through these and say, okay, which movements do they know, which don't they know? All right, so let's go through gallop, okay? Oh, I'm not even gonna demonstrate. Gallop, <laughs> first gear, go. Okay, so stop and switch the lead leg. Switch the lead leg now. And some of you are going, oh, I was really switching it. Now shift to a slide. 
a lateral slide. So there shouldn't be any difference. It's still the same lead leg going all the way through. Okay, stop. So we could continue to play go-go stop with this. So I'm going to accelerate this a little bit. We could play go-go stop, same idea. Now, oh, uh, anybody yet vigorous, huffing and puffing? No, okay, that's good. Okay, sir, I don't see anybody uh, throwing up, so that's really good. Great, that's the, next, that's the next phase. Again, I'm gonna activate the brain now. So let's just go back to forward running. So I'll just quickly demonstrate on the, on the purple cones here. I'm going forward, so now I'm gonna add a new command. Instead of stop, I'm gonna go switch. So as soon as you hear switch, turn around, go the opposite way. So I'm going this way, switch, turn around, go that way. That's agility, that's starting the piece of dodge. So I'm going to throw two, si two commands, stop or switch. You have to react, which means you have to listen. You got to get the brain engaged. Okay, ready? So music's going to go on. That's when you signal to go. Good, so that's a stop. <laughs> right, see, so have, have to listen, have to engage. Here we go. Switch! Switch! Okay, get the idea, all right? Okay, so we can add all the different locomotor patterns to that. You can, we could do that, we could have done that with gallop, we could have done that with slide, we can do that with this hop, okay? Jump, etc. Um, the other command that I want to add to this is reverse because when you're walk, going down White Avenue uh, down there yesterday, I don't think I saw anybody that was sober walking like this, <laughs> right? When you go to Starbucks, Brian, let's go to Starbucks. We don't, we don't go this way. So we need to get, Joyce, we need to get some celery. Let's go. Like, you don't see people doing this. But in an athletic environment, that's normal movement. But we don't, how often do you train your kids in what I call FBLD? Forward, backward, lateral, diagonal movement. Okay, so let's train it. Let's start in your figure eight. This time you're gonna have to shoulder check. Walking backwards, figure eight. Go ahead. Just walking backwards. Already for some people that's a sense of kind of, mm. I know, I know. Okay. Okay, stop. All right, so you can take that. So you can take that all the way through. So let's add a different relationship now. So just find a partner, someone to work with. Take your cones and come on over to the side over here. So as you're making your way over, find a buddy. So what we're going to do here, again, react, training reaction time is a lot of fun. Your kids, because that's what tag is, that's what go-go stop was, it's about reaction. Okay? Your kids generally don't come into class, very rarely did I have my kids coming into class saying, Mr. Young, can we run extra laps today? Can we do more push-ups? Can we do more sit-ups? Okay? But they do want to do this movement efficiency stuff and they do want to get the work on and improving the way they move, which then helps sport performance or performance period. So that's what we're gonna focus on next. And again, this one we're gonna, there's a couple ways you can do these. These, so the, the figure eight is one way to do it with a, um, the, the movement pattern. So here's another one. So what you're gonna do with this one is, um, if Joyce is my partner, I'm gonna stand facing my partner arm's length away. So if you wanna do that, stand facing your partner. You don't need the cones. It was just to get them out of the way. Oh, but you gotta, you gotta, everybody's coming out this way. So we're all, we're all moving across the floor this way. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, otherwise it's safety that you'll we'll run into each other. So very quickly, we're going to have um, the person facing me is the coach. The person with their back to me is the athlete or the student. Okay? So coach, what we want to try to do now is train the student how to move backwards and react and stop. So again, this is go-go stop, but you as the coach create when you go and when you stop. Okay? So we really want to, I don't want to say dumb this down, but just really start very, very slowly. So don't introduce the concept of varying speeds. Okay, don't, don't speed up, don't run. Okay, just keep a constant speed. So we want to do what is called a predictable pattern. So all you're going to do, coach, is just simply go two steps, stop. Two steps, stop. Okay? Free help is hard to find. <laughs> so, student, you know every two steps you're going to stop. But what I want you to avoid is that stride stop. I want you to stop. Stop. Okay? So what you're going to do, let's say this is halfway to the gym, across the gym. Coach, first half predictable, second half unpredictable. Meaning, it could be one step, it could be two, could be three, could be five, whatever. You're looking to see how that person stops. And then you just simply reverse roles coming back. Okay, so go ahead. Predictable first. Two steps. Oh, stop. Okay, stop, stop for a sec. Now, this is great to, to give the idea, but now I want to bring this to an athletic context. All right? We actually have coach who is now offense and student who is actually defense. You're defending. So if you think of that framework, do you want to have sometimes the mass separation that you had from the individual? Okay? You don't want to be this far away. Right? Uh, Patrick, right? If Patrick is the, is the coach and I'm the student or he's on offense and I'm on defense, I don't want to be this far away. Okay, I want to be in what's called arm's length distance. And that's that, that's that area that I want to stay in. Okay, so it's fingertip to fingertip. That's the distance. And this is the distance that game-breaking plays occur. Okay, so within this distance. That's why agility, speed are really critical in this distance. Okay, when it's this distance, not an issue. I have an advantage or he has an advantage. But when we're close in this fingertip, that's hard. If it gets inside that, if he's on offense, I'm on defense, if I'm inside that fingertip, who's got the advantage? Okay? Because if he goes this way, I'm already in a chase position half a step behind him. Okay? But if he's here and he goes this way, I'm still going to maintain that. So this concept of the separation is what you're working on in this. Okay, so think of that now. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, see, I'm ready. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, so that's just a little a teaser, a little sample of what you can do. Um, you're all excellent teachers. You can sort of take that framework and go and apply it to what you're trying to do. But the whole idea is to improve movement efficiency. And then you're looking at brain-related components. The reaction and the balance are critical, okay, in terms of reacting to that. Are you going to give us any, like, activity lists or anything? Yeah, this, there's a sheet that's coming around now. Can you tell us about the 
So, you've been um, playing uh, movement that's what I like to call them, right? So you have your oh, your sorry. Your maker on the phone. What I'm going to the shop to you now is the movement that is alongside each other, one behind the other, is he leading and I'm following? So the task which Glenn showed you before, you can change the way the task is done by just selecting a different category of the data. You can have directions, you can have a change in level. You could have been doing a figure of eight. That's a low level, right? Because it helps me modify the tax for the children of the testing to keep them engaged. And it also helps me to differentiate the tax for the testing ability levels that I have. Can you move to the challenges? Let's say I have a particular task, which is drawing on their hands at the board. 
that's a particular task. What is the cure I'm going to be using to help the kids learn how to throw properly? Obviously, it might be stepping with your foot, tick, tuck. So those would be the cues that I would be using. But how am I going to get there to work on step, tick, tuck? I can apply a series of challenges. And especially with the elementary kids, they can get very creative in how you can, you can uh, apply it. So repetition could be, I'd like you to throw, and each time you throw and hit the wall, you spell the letter of your name. So we're getting the kids to practice, and they're spelling N A R I. It could be counting if you're doing math. It could be counting in multiplication tables, three, six, nine. So that's a way for you to also do some cross curricular. That leads us to the cognitive effect. Cognitive challenges are, for example, you might give the students where they have to select a number and they keep it in their mind. So the number might be 10. And then they have to add 3 plus 2 minus 1. So the upper grades would have a more complex mathematical challenge. Time. How many throws I'm going to put on the music? And when music stops, I want to see how many throws you can do. The timer for 30 seconds or less. Play the music again. Now, how, do you manage to get more this time? Keeping score. How many times did you successfully hit the target on the wall? Pre-play um, is one which requires a bit more, um, like it's harder to, uh, to apply, because um, you'd need a video. When I was working on my dissertation data collection, I was working with this teacher, and she had a big table set up. And so the children were throwing, but then after they had their practice, they would move to the next station, see themselves, because the teacher was showing them the way they were performing, they could analyze their performance. When they rotate to the next one, then they continue working on the, on the throw. So the replay and preview are, are related together. Variety. If they're working on throw, change from them throwing balls to throwing chicks, throwing fish. So changing up the equipment enables you to still get the kids to still work on the same skill, but there's variety in it. And especially if we're working with the one. They can be working on this time, you can use red balls, and on this time you can use blue balls. If you, you want to jump and land the blue hoops, this time you're going to look for yellow hoops. So these are all the different ways that you can utilize to, help the to give the children a motivation to continue practicing at the skill that they are at. And you might have the kid who is tossing and turning and catching, spelling his name, and you might have another kid down here who is just <coughs> learning how to toss and catch. So you have the differentiation of the challenge is being applied at the different ability levels that you have. And the great thing about having the challenges going well in your class is that you also use it at the time to assess where your kids are at. Are they performing the cues? Where do I need to step in? Is it task too hard for another child versus another? So then I would move up and down on the easier to hard. And so when we're teaching, we're teaching for learning. We're assessing for learning. And now this is how we move into, how can we look at the child, see where they are at, how are we going to determine how to take them to the next level, and what is it that I as a teacher can do? Do you want to talk about that? So, no, this is for you. Yeah, this is just the same example. Okay, okay. Okay. So, we're just going to take a manipulative skill, really simple, basic, catching, because the idea is not about the catching, but it's the practice observing. And it's just, that's the skill that I think uh, teachers find hard to do um, in terms of to be able to observe and provide the feedback. So I've developed um, K-3 to lesson plans um, that focus on fundamental movement skills. And, and I've sent those to Tracy and Joyce. So if you want them, you can access them from Tracy and Joyce. But it, they're, they're, I designed them because in BC, just like you, we have generalist teachers. And they're not trained in teaching physical education. So I developed what are initially literally scripted lesson plans. So very, very detailed. And what we found in our pilot of, of this early learning physical literacy pilot is that the teachers, it was too much information for them. So they wanted to create a cheat sheet. 
And so they've got down to a one pager, which is what I've really always wanted. It's just a, a one page cheat sheet that just has the basic information. So within those um, is these task progressions with the cues and challenges that Marina was talking about. Um, but then at the end of the lesson, and I, and I put it at the end and I say it's optional because I don't want the teacher to go and, and evaluate the kid when they're just learning these skills. So I just say it's at the, put it at the end, I say it's optional, try it a little later on. But it's just an assessment tool. Okay, so this one is around catching. So with your partner, you can take any object you like and try to look at what the criteria is within each of the parts of the scale. So it's emerging, it's developing, and it's acquired. Okay, so look at the characteristics of your partner um, and just see if you can observe these characteristics in the catching part. Okay, so I just want to give you a chance to practice that and then we, well, like we're already late, so we'll have to wrap it up after that. I'll try to squeeze that. You can do a group of three. Oh. You could self assess. <laughs> oh, wait. I like that. I like this. Yeah. I think of these with like the bubble stuff. Group of three. Or you have an individual. Okay, stop. Come on back. So come on down here. We'll just quickly wrap up. So I had, I had a question, um, was there another level above this? And we do have another level, it's called accomplished. But in terms of these fundamental skills, they're really, when I was looking at catching, like what would be, because this is early learning, so this is K to three. What's gonna be accomplished for a grade two or grade one in, ca in catching, right? I mean, we want them to be able to catch in, in basic two-hand catch, not trap against the body, depending on the grade level. But, I mean, we, we are not looking for the over-the-shoulder diving, toes in, sideline. That's, that's accomplished. We're not looking for that at that age level. So that's why there's only three levels there. Um, questions? So, so that, you, that, that sheet that you had, where the skill sets, have you developed a whole series of those, or did you get that from somewhere? Or? Uh, this one? Uh, yes. I found... Uh, I found a, a good starting point from uh, New Zealand. And New Zealand has this really well laid out. So I'm not about reinventing the wheel. So I just took it and sort of BCized it. <laughs> so it was on the PHE resources, the series upstairs, those fundamental movement skill PHE Canada ones. Uh, each, it's not a group of Properly, they will have, you know, they will have the step in the help properly. So that's there too. Yeah. There's lots of resources. Is this on the BC Ministry website? No, no, it's it's uh, developed for Surrey. How many lesson plans did you develop? Uh, four for each. Our phase one is four for each grade level. So four for K, one, two, and three. We're just going to start this fall the development of another um, four or maybe eight, depending on how much money there is, to add to those four per grade level. So we're hoping eventually for 12 per grade level. And that's what, um, that's what Glenn's talking about that, he, that uh, we have. So we will post those on the website, on the Physical Literacy website. So when we have that, when we send out a survey uh, to all of you, we'll say, okay, they're posted, the video's up, the presentation beside that, all the PowerPoint presentations are up. So those will all be available on our website. Great. How often do you do those dynamic warm-ups? Every day. Because it's a warm-up, right? So they get, the kids are getting a chance to practice those every day. Yeah, so, so what Marina showed you with the, the frit, that's your menu.
right? so you're going to select your ingredients. I was, actually, in my gym, I have the kids choose which ones they want to do. I spent some time, yes, at the beginning of the school year having them you know, all do the same, but eventually I, I diversify them. I mean, now the kids even go with their jump ropes and they're doing their figure based with jump ropes. They can do it with the basketball, they can do it with the soccer ball. So, however, they want to run at it. When they're coming into my gym, the very first thing they're going to do is start moving. So depending what unit on that, the equipment they're using. Whatever, they have choices. Glenn, do you have a copy of, or do we, are we allowed to have a copy of these? I can email that to Tracy. If that's okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, all I did was, uh, I mean, it's easy to do, but don't reinvent the wheel. I'll just print, uh, send it to you. I'll send it as a Word doc. Uh, if you want to take out my school district logo, put in your division logo, you can do that. Uh, print it out on a card, laminate it, and there you go. Because, again, this is my classroom. Your, your regular classrooms are rich with learning material on the walls. What do you see in the gym? Either nothing or banners of accomplishment, but nothing about learning. It's important to put this out. This is the vocabulary of movement. This is how we're okay. helping our kids become fluent. Question. You, you used some words for when you fly the figure eight again. I just want to write down something about the lateral kind of movement. What, what, why did you choose figure eight again? Oh, the, the figure eight movement is a great way to, to warm up your lower body. So you're warming up the medial and the lateral aspects of your body. So the inside and the outsides of your, of your body. Okay, ankles, knees, and hips, which are really important in what's called triple flexion, which is this motion. 